And God put this message on my heart uh, about a, a number of, maybe two years ago already at this point, to talk to this church family on the sub- subject of uh, forgiveness. And when Ron asked me to take this morning's service, it was really a good opportunity to share with you about forgiveness. Some of you have attended the teaching events that I hold, and those of you that have attended know that I don't teach anything and share anything that hasn't had an impact on my own life. And this subject of forgiveness is no different. And it comes from my mother. My mother uh, loved the Lord dearly. She had become a Christian in a most spectacular way. She met the Lord in the dirty 30s. Dad in the hospital with a nervous breakdown because we were losing, he, she, they were losing their land. And she was uh, covering her tomato plants in October so she could trade them, at, pick them ripe and trade them at the store for products that she needed like salt and pepper and so forth. And she was in great turmoil. And she sensed the presence of Jesus walking down the other side of the aisle with her as she covered tomato plants in the dark with a baby girl in the house. But my mother's desire for me to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as she had took the form of manipulation and guilt. And I really disliked that. I intensely hated it. And I rejected her for how she tried to manipulate me. And through God's work, through this teaching, God performed a great act of reconciliation with my mother. She was so old, I don't know if she really understood it anymore, but it certainly, it certainly impacted me. And I would like to do something this morning. I'd like to compare forgiveness with oil, specifically motor oil. Now, I'll remind you that all earthly illustrations are uh, fall short of uh, really explaining a spiritual truth. But let's use a car with the damaged and dead motors an illustration of how oil works. The car is us. We were spiritually dead beyond hope. Our power source, the motor, was totally useless. And the car, we needed a new motor. A new power source to function as God intended us to function. So God, our master mechanic, took out the old dead spirit and exchanged it for a brand new spirit empowered by God, like putting a new motor in a car. Now the car has a new motor. The gas tank is full of premium. Everything is ready to go, right? And you turn the key and it starts. But what did you forget? A new motor out of a crate doesn't come with oil in it. You forgot to put oil in the motor. Derek, how long will it run? A few minutes, a few minutes. And it'll seize up rock solid and it'll no no longer function as it was designed. Sometimes people come to what I teach and they're absolutely impressed with what they hear. They've never heard it before. And it doesn't take long and they sometimes come to me and they say this, this message of freedom and grace isn't working for me. I don't know what is wrong. Knowing my new life in Christ is just not working. Well, could the reason why the experience of God's grace seems to have escaped you is is simply unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is a huge problem in the Christian world. It stops spiritual growth dead in in its tracks. It severs relationships. It breaks apart churches. And this behavior by Christians sends the message to the world that Christ's reconciliation on the cross was pointless and devoid of power. And the unbeliever rejects Christ, thinking Christianity is no different than any other religion. I believe that this is the experience of many Christians. Their their Christian lives are at a standstill. Spiritual stagnation has taken place. Grace is designed to flow in a Christian's life like living water, like the the stream on the picture. But the day-to-day experience of many is that the freedom and abundant life promised by Jesus is not a reality. For a Christian to function the way God has designed them to function, it is imperative that forgiveness is understood, embraced by faith, 
and then poured out in faith to others. See, forgiveness is like the oil in a motor. Oil keeps the motor running smoothly, just like it was designed to run. So it is with the Christian. The oil of forgiveness empowers the Christian to live like God has designed us to live, in harmony with each other, expressing God's love toward each other. Remember how the song goes, they shall know we are Christians by our love. And the demonstration of love is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the most important aspect of Christianity. Without forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of Christ, we would be still mired in our depravity. Without forgiveness, Christianity wouldn't exist. And it seems that those who have been forgiven so much have a great deal of trouble extending the same kind of forgiveness toward those who've hurt them. And instead they display unforgiveness. And God full knew, knew full well that we would have trouble as Christians with forgiving. So he gave us a commandment in Hebrews 12. He says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing... He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. See to it. It's a command in the Greek. Knowing the grace of God gives the Christian no option but to deal with unforgiveness. And those of us who've walked with unforgiveness know well how, what kind of fruit unforgiveness bears. And it bears a terrible fruit. And the Bible calls this fruit bitterness. And the effect of unforgiveness is clear. It causes trouble in our relationships. And our bitterness becomes like an infectious disease that spreads to those in in our sphere of influence. And no matter how remorseful we may feel, how many tears we shed, how deep our regret, none of these will prevent bitterness from developing. The only way to stop bitterness is to forgive. You see, Hebrews 12 is really about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is simply this. It's forgiveness withheld. And it leads to the development of bitterness in your life. And unforgiveness at its core is rejection. See, we want to reject others to keep and help, to, to prevent us from being hurt again. So we reject others and then we won't feel hurt and we won't feel rejected by them. The bottom line for rejection is this, it is the flesh. So what really is the flesh? Well, it's not our physical bodies. That's not what I'm talking about. Flesh is this pattern of living or this way of coping with life. Flesh is my way of coping with life independent of God. And where did this start? Where did this life start? Where did this pattern of living start? Well, it began in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, stepped out to exercise their independence and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This independent pattern of living has been passed on to all mankind, where mankind in his own abilities is always deciding how to live life. And I do that by using all of my natural talents and abilities, things like intelligence, Maybe how I reason. Maybe my physical attributes. And an unbeliever has no choice but to rely on their flesh. But the Christian, even though the flesh was not eradicated at salvation, has choice to live independent of God or dependent upon the indwelling life of Christ. And the Bible says about the flesh in Jeremiah 17.9, that it is wicked, deceived, it cannot be fixed, and no man knows his flesh unless God produces a self-revelation. Our flesh is very despicable. And there's some very common traits to all of mankind. The flesh always wants to be in control. It is self-protective, self-centered. 
It's I centered to the core. Its preoccupation is with itself and getting its own needs met. And this fleshly attitude dominates how we function. And we think that this way of living is just me. That's just how I am. God's response to the flesh is that he hates it. And he calls it sin. And in Galatians 5.17, it says that there's continual conflict between the spirit of God that indwells a believer and the flesh. There's a war. It's always going on. And Romans 8.7 makes it clear that the flesh is hostile to God. It will not submit to God. And sadly, we are prone to rely on the flesh rather than depend on God. We were spiritually regenerated by God to depend upon His indwelling life. And when we don't, there is always conflict. Now the questionnaire, I don't know how many of you actually pursued, perused that very well, but that questionnaire we went through, how many times do we see the first person pronoun, I, me, or mine, I think I, me, or my in this one, in the 12 statements? Well, 17 times that pronoun is used. What does that tell you about this questionnaire? Well, it's self-centered. Can you see how these ways of understanding forgiveness are fleshly ways? Designed by the flesh so it can stay in control? None of these ways of forgiving are truly forgiveness. They're actually misunderstandings of forgiveness. Mostly they are fleshly ways of trying to mask over the pain and hurt or rationalize it away. And one way to know if we are walking after the flesh and living in unforgiveness is that you'll be doing this. You'll be holding somebody accountable for their offense against you. And what that does, that increases blindness, chaos, and confusion in our lives. And we can compare that to to a man with a projector. We have a projector problem. It's like going out for for supper with somebody and there's a big screen TV behind them and all you can do is look at the big screen TV. You're totally preoccupied with it. It makes us blind. We are self-centered. And our mind is blinded to the devastating effect, effect that our unforgiveness is having on us. It confuses us. In our confused thinking, we believe that withholding forgiveness, the other person will suffer for the offense that they've dealt us. You know, it's like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. And you suffer all the effects of the poison of bitterness while the other person perhaps isn't even aware of the hurt that they've caused you. And it creates more chaos and uncertainty and insecurity. This obsession with the offense caused against us causes us to think of nothing else but the offense. Our thought life becomes increasingly chaotic as cyclic thoughts of revenge occupy our thinking. And at the center of the turmoil is me and my hurt. And worst of all, Now you're in bondage to unforgiveness and Satan gloats because the grace of God has become essentially of no effect in your life for daily living. The reason for God's warning in Hebrews about bitterness is that it keeps us from receiving His grace. A Christian knows better than to allow their unforgiveness and growing bitterness out into the open so they hide behind a mask that looks like everything is all right but given the right circumstances everyone is shocked to see how out pops bitterness and it came very clear in my own life when we went to visit my parents once my father was in his late late 80s and um, Barb and kids and my mom had gone shopping and we were sitting alone in the living room and dad starts to talk to me about an incident that had happened many years ago and my dad started to get angry my dad was an angry man 
He always had a smile on his face. His eyes twinkled. He told jokes. He was a wonderful man to be around. Here dad's getting angry. And angrier and angrier. And this wasn't like my father. And so I finally asked him, I said, I said, Dad, did, did any of this disagreement with these other two people that you're telling me about, did that have any effect on you? And he goes, no. He had just taken one of the sides of one of the two combatants in this issue. And I said, Dad, the next question is, Dad, I said, are any of them alive? No, the other two had died. Isn't it interesting how unforgiveness can travels through centuries of time and has no effect even on you. You maybe aren't even directly involved in it. And bitterness has huge implications in the behavior of someone who is living with the effects of bitterness. And after I heard my dad tell that story and after we talked a little bit, I vowed I didn't want to live like he was living. I didn't want to have any of that boiling deep underneath me and motivating my behavior. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a tree to illustrate the effect of bitterness. <clears throat> we're going to see that the tree trunk is bitterness. And the fruit on the branches are going to be the evidence of unforgiveness. And we're going to look at the, what kind of roots feed this tree. And I'll say it again, bitterness is the greatest barrier preventing us from progressing to an experiential understanding of grace. And I'll acknowledge this, the offense against you is very personal. And the pain experienced is very real. And have you ever tried to deal with it this way? Have you played a movie clip in your head about all the pain someone has inflicted upon you and in that movie clip you plan scenarios of revenge? What do you do? You experience all over again the painful emotions. Reliving all the bitter feelings towards that person and you start suffering the despair and the depression that accompany this ongoing saga of pain and meanwhile the other person is scot-free. He has no idea what's going on in your head. So who suffers from bitterness? Well, you do. The other person really pays nothing for your pain as he's not even aware of what's going on, that there's a problem. And every tree needs a root system. So what kind of tr roots feed this, this bitterness tree? Well, one of them is selfishness. Selfishness is one root that feeds this tree. And it raises its ugly head when we attempt to suck from those around us our need for love and acceptance. To meet our expectations and to fill our desires. And we meet with failure over and over and over again. And it produces deep feelings of rejection and pain. So we become even more self-serving, which produces even more rejection and pain. It's a vicious cycle that leads to developing the kinds of fruit we're going to look at on the branches. Unbelief is another one. We will never trust God if we don't know Him. Our poor fellowship with God and lack of understanding lead us to fear that God can't meet all our needs in Christ Jesus. great example of that is the Israelite story in the Old Testament, where God's abundant life, His promised land, was just across a little river that was only six inches deep, and their, and their fear of entering in and trusting Him bred unbelief. And then where did they live for 40 years? In the wilderness. In the wilderness. We don't trust God to do what he says he'll do. That's unbelief. And the root system that fuels this tree produces very bitter fruit. On one branch it produces anger, fueled by my selfishness, not getting my needs met. The other branch it, it produces fear. It's a product of my, my fear and my unbelief. And if you're suffering from any of these following flesh patterns, perhaps bitterness is the problem. Things like worry, anxiety, loneliness, doubts, depression. Now you're depressed, aren't you? Inferiority. 
Maybe on the anger side you live with resentment. Maybe criticism. Criticism. And later on we'll talk about a little bit about sarcasm. They were they're 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 deeply ingrained in how I function. And the root of it can be called bitterness, hatred, jealousy, and then sarcasm, unforgiveness, gossip, and envy. We Christians live in a fallen world, and at one time or another, all of us will exhibit some of these symptoms of bitterness. These behaviors bring with them the devastating feelings of guilt and conviction that we have sinned. And as Christians, we know how to deal with these symptoms. We repent, we ask forgiveness, but the symptoms return in time. Let's use an outburst of anger as an example. The guilt produced by our behavior is dealt with by asking for forgiveness. But the root which caused this anger has not been eradicated. Spring is coming. It may not look like it today, but spring is coming. The grass is going to turn green. And what's going to be the first beautiful yellow flower you see? The dandelions. Now, how are you going to get rid of them? What's the easiest way to get rid of them? Take the lawnmower out and mow off all the flowers and the, and the leaves. Is the root dealt with? No. How quickly is it going to come back? About a week and there's going to be another bright little yellow flower sticking out of your lawn, right? You see, when our only solution to the problem is asking God for forgiveness for our sinful behavior, the result is a treadmill style of living which in its futility will become increasingly rapid in its repetition and drive us to despair. The treadmill we put ourselves on is this, is we sin, and that produces feelings of guilt over our actions. The Holy Spirit convicts us that we have sinned, and we turn to God and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness from Him. And then we grit our teeth, and we vow we're going to try harder again next time. But what happens? We fail again. And around and around and around the treadmill goes. We are trying our best efforts to deal with these symptoms of bitterness. We know that anger is not acceptable, so we repress our anger. The evidence of this way of living is reflected on on, on our faces. We sometimes clench our jaws, or we purse our lips, or we look down, we look depressed. You see, this self-effort or fleshly way of dealing with life is designed to fail. And it's an instrument of Satan to cause us to believe that the Christian life doesn't work. Christ's shed blood deals with the forgiveness of our actions, but it doesn't deal with the root of the problem, and that's our bitterness. Now, I want to say this, is don't go looking for something that the Holy Spirit has not revealed to you. Ask God to reveal your bitterness to you if you are bitter. If you go looking for something that may not be there, it just takes your eyes off of Christ. And the only way to deal with these issues of bitterness is to let God bring death to the root. To deal with our selfishness, remember Jesus, whom you have treated far worse than anyone has ever treated you. It was your sin that took him to the cross so that his love could be expressed to you. Unbelief. Be honest with God. Go to him and ask, help me in my unbelief. This action alone will seed trust in God to deal with this tree. In Hebrews 12, 15, God clearly points out that bitterness causes trouble. And the following we're going to look at are are just a few major issues that arise because of living with bitterness. Bitterness will prevent the grace of God from flowing in your life. All I want you to do is to look at what we had on the bitterness tree and ask if it's com- any of the fruit on that tree is compatible with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of them are. So if you're going to live out of bitterness, what's going to, prevent, what's, what's going to be prevented from flowing out of you is God's grace. You won't know it experientially yourself and you will not be able to give it to someone else. Bitterness causes trouble. 
Often the trouble in a Christian's life is bitterness. Their relationships, and in, especially in a church family, can sometimes be traced back to a root of bitterness that manifests itself in a whole body of believers. Divides siblings between themselves. As Terry said this morning, and siblings and parents. It breaks friendships. It ruins a work relationship. And it often causes church splits. Bitterness defiles many. It contaminates. It is contagious. Past parents to children and friend to friend. Sadly, when we live in bitter, bitterness or live with bitterness, we pass it on to our children. It's like a virus infecting one generation after the other. And many Christians are afflicted with this virus. Deuteronomy 5.19 tells us that the sins of the fathers are passed on to the third and the fourth generation. Could it be something that we've just learned from our parents? Perhaps even before we can truly comprehend what's going on? This is a really sad one. You become like the person you're bitter toward. You develop a fixation on them. How many people are bitter towards their parents and then they become just like them? Proverbs 14.30 A tranquil heart is life to the body, but bitterness is rottenness to the bones. The New Living Translation trans this scripture passage this way. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. The Amplified says this, a calm and undisturbed mind and heart are life and health of the body, but envy, jealousy, and wrath are like rottenness to the bones. What was the fruit on the bitterness tree? And the message paraphrase says, a sound mind makes for a robust body, but runaway emotions corrode the bones. The way we think determines how our emotional life will function. When we're obsessed with thoughts of unforgiveness, the resulting bitterness will produce emotions like envy and jealousy and anger. And God's word is clear that when we think this way, our physical bodies will suffer. Perhaps some of you know enough about the medical industry or or the medical situation in life to, to answer this question, where is blood made? Well, in the long bones, in the marrow of our long bones. So my question is, how much of our physical illness could be attributed to bitterness? To begin the process of embracing the healing Jesus provides for our damaged emotions, we must acknowledge that we have been hurt by what someone has said or done. Trying to hide the hurt will only intensify the struggle and each time the event is remembered, the same painful emotions crop up over and over again. And usually at the most inopportune time, you'll find somebody getting angry or burst into tears. Is the promise of Jesus in Luke 4.18 real? Is it true? He proclaimed in in the temple that God has sent me to heal up the brokenhearted, to proclaim proclaim liberty to the captives are you being held captive by your bitterness then the one suffering is you not the other person allow Jesus to set you free allow the great physician to heal you healing from our past hurts can be realized through the following steps we have a forgiveness diagram and we have God And then we have me. And what separated God from me? Well, sin separated me from God. And so how did God deal with my sin issue? Well, he dealt with my sin issue through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which paid the penalty for my sin. And God, my Father, looks to the cross to the work of his son on the cross to deal with my sin. Scripture is clear. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what has happened to sin? Well, sin is actually exits through the cross. 
And God extends forgiveness to me by looking at Jesus' sacrifice for my sin. And forgiveness is realized in my life when I receive and agree with God that Christ's work on the cross was sufficient to deal with my sin. And then praise God, we have restored relationship with God. God and I are reconciled by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can live in relationship together. But the question is this, how does this biblical principle of forgiveness apply to my personal life, my personal situation? Well, we have me, again, and I'm separated from someone we were going to call the offender. And what are we separated from them by? Well, we're separated from with an offense. Something stands between us. This individual did something to hurt me. And we'll pull the same scripture up again. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The question is, did Christ die for the offense that this person has perpetrated on you? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Forgiveness is personal. Jesus died personally for for you. Your forgiveness of someone else is also personal. And Ephesians is really clear. It says, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. How did God forgive you? When looking to the finished work of Christ on the cross. So I'll ask the question again. Is the offense perpetrated against you dealt at the cross through Jesus Christ? It has to be. God does not offer the option of putting conditions on the finished work of his son. It isn't a question of whether the other person understands God's forgiveness, receives it, or even knows of it. But the issue is is that Christ's son died for that offense. Do you agree with God that the offense has been dealt with at the cross by Jesus? If that's the case, then in your Understanding that offense has been dealt with and is out of the way. You see, how do I forgive this person? Well, just exactly like God forgave me, by looking to the cross to acknowledge that the offense has been forgiven by Jesus' shed blood. And I extend that forgiveness to the offender. We need to realize that without Christ, forgiveness is impossible. And then comes the commandment by God. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Let all. It's another command by God and very similar to the one in Hebrews 12.15 where it says, see to it. Forgiveness is not an option for a Christian. It's not an option. And it's not an option that you would feel like it. When we talk about our soul, we have a mind, will, and emotions. What portion of your soul is involved in forgiveness? Well, it's your will. You choose to put away, to forgive. It is no different than the time Jesus spent in Gethsemane, saying, not my will, but yours be done. Set yourself free from the bondage to bitterness and choose to step out in faith and acknowledge your weakness and rest in his strength to forgive. I need to come to understand that I cannot forgive in my own strength. The only way to know the healing promised by Jesus is to depend upon Christ in me to forgive. And who is going to come And try to destroy that decision you made. Satan's going to be there at the door instantly, knocking and saying, "Oh, look how you feel. You really didn't. You really didn't forgive him, or you really didn't forgive them." And he's going to attack your decision over and over about forgiving. But stand firm on the truth that Christ shed blood has been enough. You see, the natural or the unregenerate man really cannot understand forgiveness because they do not know the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. 
And then sometimes, if the Lord is willing, there is restoration between you and the offender. It may never be accomplished. No one should put themselves back in a situation of harm or maybe continuous abuse. Allow this work of forgiveness to take root in your own life and leave the attempts to reconcile with your offender up to God as he may arrange the circumstance. Trying to reconcile with someone who has no interest in reconciliation will only produce more pain. Or maybe they have no clue they even hurt you. And that just opens up a scenario you don't need to enter into. Or maybe opening old wounds that will probably even hamper reconciliation. And then you can go to the cemetery and you can look at that dead rock with your offender's name engraved on it and you can scream all you want and you'll never realize forgiveness that way. If the offender is dead and restoration in this earthly world is not possible. But from your side, forgiveness has taken place. And so for most of us, <laughs> there are reasons... We, we resist, uh, we experience resistance against entering this process of forgiveness. And the following reasons may give some insight as to what our problem is. And it is our responsibility to deny, to deny these excuses and step out in faith and forgive. When you withhold forgiveness from somebody, who are you playing? God. And it may come as a surprise you're not God. How about pride? Forgiving will make me look weak. Or I wouldn't be or feel in control. Remember the flesh loves to be in control. If, or, if I forgive, I might get hurt again. I might be a doormat. In our fallen world, will we get hurt over and over again? Absolutely. The problem will go away if I ignore it. Uh, that, that's not true. It will continue to fester. It's unfair. They need to pay for their sin. Who paid? Who paid for their sin? Jesus paid for their sin. I'm waiting for them to come to me first. You could wait a long time, and if they're dead, it'll never happen. They're not sorry for what they did. I'd be hypocritical. I don't feel like forgiving. I just address that. It's not a matter of how you feel. It's a matter of what you choose. And this last one, I think, is one of the greatest things that prohibit us from entering into forgiveness. Failure to understand God's love and forgiveness toward me. I think this is the root problem for most Christians. They either believe they were too bad for God to forgive their sin. It just couldn't happen. Or they don't see their sin as being as despicable as it really is. They don't see themselves in the light of a holy and righteous God. Jeremiah is clear, I will, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The first step in the process of forgiveness is, is started when you must be humble. You must be humble to forgive. And you must accept this statement as well from John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Without a humble heart, God cannot work. You must humble yourself before God before He can forgive you. And some of the ways of doing that is you acknowledge the event and the hurt. Acknowledging the feeling that you have. And you release the person from the debt. I forgive you. You are now free. How do you do that? Through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as God forgave you, you forgive that person. And you accept the person unconditionally. Surrender any conditions. You see, rejection is the way our flesh deals with the pain of being hurt. And it's exactly opposite of how God deals with hurt, and that is to forgive. Be willing to risk being hurt again. Be willing to risk being hurt again. Are you a risk taker? 
If you're a risk taker and you step out, you'll suddenly find you're no longer self-centered, but suddenly you're other-centered. You're more concerned with their welfare than with your own. To quickly review the forgiveness process. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Verse 32 is the method of forgiveness. How did God forgive me? Well, he forgave me by what Christ did on the cross. God needed Jesus to die in order to forgive my sin. I need to recognize my death with Christ in order to forgive others. And I cannot forgive anyone in my own strength. Without the work of Christ on the cross, we would have remained separated for, for, from God for all of eternity. As it is with God, so it is without the cross we cannot forgive. Without the cross we cannot forgive. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But who lives in me? Christ lives in me. It's Christ in us who forgives. His indwelling life in us is manifest as forgiveness. Remember, Jesus has gone this path before you. He died for sins that he didn't commit. And he said, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. He released them to God. And then he said, it's finished. It's finished. The debt is paid. Bill Ewing says this, in rest assured, forgiveness is the divine transaction paid in full by the blood of Jesus which frees both the offender and the offended from the bondage of sin. You see, 1 John 2 is very clear. And he himself, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. It's a continual attitude that Jesus paid for the sin that whoever committed against me. I must agree with God that this is so in order to truly forgive. You know, this is not a, not a one-time process. It doesn't ensure that the other person's going to change. That's God's problem. My feelings may or may not change, and that's also God's problem. And one of the hardest people to understand, uh, to, to deal with forgiveness, may be myself. I must receive my own forgiveness to truly understand God's forgiveness of the other person. What if that person hurts me again? Well, I forgive and I keep my accounts at zero. And who might I need to forgive? Well, there could be many people in your lives. Maybe your mate, family members, friends, etc., Agree with God that he has dealt with the offense at the cross and make this real in my life. To make it real in my life, I say this, thank you, Father. Thank you. The Message Bible says this, or the Message Paraphrase says this, be quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you, in Colossians 3.13. God's instruction is clear. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Forgive somebody else the same way. Juan Carlos Ortiz says this, Why did God forgive? It makes him happy. You see, forgiveness is the most important relationship builder. We, through forgiveness, have the restored relationship with God. Through forgiveness, our human relationships will be restored. And I have a question for you. Does bitterness and unforgiveness suit you as a Christian? No, no. You have a regenerated spirit with the indwelling life of Christ within you, and that does not suit that 
manifestation of that spirit. Perhaps God is preparing you for a deeper work of grace in your life. I'm not sure. But I can say this, if you enter into this journey, you will be blessed beyond your comprehension. And you will realize the grace of grace and mercy and the healing of God. I'm going to share with you a story of Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom and her Dutch family hid Jews from the Nazis in World War II. For this, she endured Ravensbrück, a concentration camp. Her inspiring story became a famous book and film, The Hiding Place. In 1947, in in a Munich church, she told a German audience that God forgives. When we confess our sins, she explained, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. After her presentation, she recognized a man approaching her, a guard from Ravensbrück, before whom she had had to walk naked. Chilling memories flooded back. A fine message, Fraulein, said the man. How good it is to know know that. As you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And he extended his hand in greeting. Corey recalled, I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, but I remembered him and the leather crop hanging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. The man continued, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there. But since that time I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. He extended his hand again. He said, will you forgive me? Corey stood there, unable to forgive. As anger and vengeance raged inside her, she remembered Jesus' death for this man. How could she refuse? But she lacked the strength. She silently asked God to forgive her and help her forgive him. As she took his hand, she felt a warm, healing warmth flooding her body. I forgive you, brother, she cried, with all my heart. And so, Corey later recalled, I discovered it is not on our forgiveness anymore, that our, on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on God's. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, and along with the command, the love itself. Father, we give you praise and glory this morning for the amazing work that you have done in lives. Father, our May we all come to know and recognize the depth of our forgiveness in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. A miracle beyond our comprehension has taken place. And Father, I pray that you make our understanding of forgiveness so real that we without doubt are willing to extend it like Corey was willing to extend forgiveness to this man who had so cruelly treated her and so many of her fellow Jews. Father, we thank you for this message of forgiveness. We thank you that we, in our own weakness, cannot forgive, but you within us are the sufficiency to forgive anyone and anything that's ever occurred. I have no idea what hurts are burning in the minds of the people in this congregation, Lord. But I trust that you are going to do a deep work in their lives and release them from the unforgiveness that they live with. Father, I recognize it has been an amazing work of restoration in my own life and I give you the praise and the glory and the thanks for that. Father, we step out in faith to receive what you've so freely provided for us. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.